Welcome to another edition of the Brazilian Shirt Name podcast. He is the legend, you know, Tim Vickery. He's in Rio, and as always, he's got a nice shirt on, and he's looking the part of a South American uh, football correspondent from the UK. Nice shirt. Shame about the boat race. And he is Dot and Adebayo, with a hat, without a hat, whatever. It's still one of the greatest heads in radio. Uh, well, more importantly, uh, it's not a wig. Do you, do you want to have a yank? I saw your tweet. I saw, I saw your tweet. This week. Go on, have, have a yank of it. All right. All right I'm, I'm, I'm moved. Oh, My hand oh, is moving across oh, it. Pull it, pull it, pull it. Oh, it ain't coming out. It yeah, ain't coming, coming out. out is it? That's today, one of Maury's then. wigs from Goodfellas. From Goodfellas. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing what super glue can do. But anyway, let's leave that to one side. Tiro, don't think I don't notice those tweets. <laughs> and your response to them as well. But we're looking at a match, as we always do. Uh, this is a cracker of a match that we're looking at today. In the Brazilian Shirt Name podcast, we look at um, uh, a memorable match from some time in the past and try and give a context, not just of the match, but of the social and cultural times uh, that the match was situated in. And we look at the charts as well. And we'll come on to that because it's a cracking chart as well. I'll tell you that. So April the 29th, 1972 is what we're looking at. So nearly 50 years ago, 49 years ago or so, England faced West Germany. And that has got to be, after England-Scotland, the second biggest rivalry in British football anyway, I'd have thought. Yeah, it's it, it's a biggie, this one. It's a really, really big one. And Germany, West Germany, as they then were, they've beaten England for the first time in a friendly in 1968, 1-0. But all the England players, they had that they had new boots on that they were getting money to be to be paid, and and you know they were hobbling around the field, and I don't think they took it particularly seriously. So then comes the 1970 World Cup, the quarterfinal, England are two 0 up and coasting with 20 minutes to go, and then it all goes wrong, and 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 the Germans win. But that, that was seen as something of a fluke. It was just one of those things. This game is the definitive moment when they overtake us. And the amazing thing about this game, it's uh, the quarterfinals of the European Championship, which are, 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 are then the tournament like was only semi-finals and final. The quarterfinals are played home and away. This is the first leg at home. The Germans coming into this game think they're going to get hammered. And they're having a chat in a tunnel thinking, you know, we're, we're going to get done here today. You know, you can imagine it being 5-0 to them. I think they, 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 so they were a little bit trepidatious. But we know from the results and we know what happens afterwards they win the they win the european championship that year they win the world cup two years later they get to the final of the european championship in 76 and lose it on on, on penalties um they win the european championship in 80 they get to the final of the world cup in 82 they get to the final of the world cup in 86 they they uh that they win the world cup in 1990 it's just years and so and this so this is the moment when they got go up a level and we go down so it's a match of huge significance it's also the first game i ever watched uh i watched the 1971 fa cup final you know charlie george and and all of that but I was too young for it, really. And, you know, I couldn't concentrate all the way through. So we kind of went away and played and then come back, came back and watched a little bit. This one, it's the next live game a few months later. And I'm that little bit older. I'm nearly seven. So I watched it all the way through. And uh, one of my mum's mates went to the game and brought me back a program. And that made me feel that, 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 I, was, that, I, that I was there. So it's, it's a magical game for me. One of the things that I remember about it is Jeff Hurst being substituted. And the commentator, I think it's Coleman, uh, you know, Hurst leaves the field after failing to do what he did against these opponents on this pitch six years ago. And I, I haven't heard that since, honest. But I still remember it because I remember thinking, Christ, that's my life. That's the span of my life, you know, just add on another year. And, uh, and, and that, that, that really blew my mind. So it's a special game for me. And I loved sitting down and watching it all the way through all over again uh, and uh, I was I was surprised by it in a number of ways um, I think it's a it's a fascinating game it surprised me in one or two ways okay and we'll come on to those one or two ways in a moment or two 
I agree with you. This is the moment where Germany are a force to contend with. They had to be England to really be taken seriously, particularly after that defeat in 66. It was England that they had to be, you know, it wasn't necessarily Brazil or Argentina or France or any other team. It was this team. And when you look, I mean, going back to that commentary, first of all, this wasn't exactly the same team that Germany fielded in the 19. 66 World Cup final. Although there were two very significant and perhaps more players, Franz Beckenbauer in the centre of defence and of course Gerd Muller who caused England all sorts of problems in this match and finally gets the third goal as well. But he caused them a lot more problems than just a normal centre forward would, by the way. But um, was it a case of Germany overtaking England in terms of players or was it a case of Sir Ralph Ramsey getting the tactics wrong? It was a case of Germany overtaking England in terms of tactics and in terms of the way the game was played. Uh, that, that's one of the amazing things watching this game now. You could be watching a Premier League side, a, a really good Premier League side or a, you know, a, a top European club side. Uh, Germany have embarked on total football. It's, it, it, it's a revolution. Actually, in the match, they don't actually create that many chances. And all the three goals that they do score are individual mistakes. And it could easily have been a draw. And England could have won. And that, that was the thing that surprised me, watching it. Because I remember it, I remember reading everything about it afterwards. And, uh, and the press were all hysterical. You know, we're shit, they're great, and, 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 and so on. And, and certainly, if you see it in hindsight, it is the moment when they, they become great, and the moment when, when, when we become shit. What surprised me watching it again was how even it was, certainly in terms of chances. And England probably just shaded it in, in terms of the number of chances. But in terms of the style of play, they, they have just moved on. They're light years ahead. And what they do is uh, it's the total football of the Dutch with one difference. And the, uh, the, the Germans don't press up as much. I remember speaking to this about Paul Breitner, uh, saying, why didn't you do that? You know, you, you did all the things of total football, but you didn't do that. And they said, and, and Breitner said, yeah, we thought it was too dangerous. We thought it was too risky. And we weren't interested in aesthetics, really. We just wanted to win. Um, so we didn't do that aggressive pressing, but everything else. And the thing that they really do is they keep the pitch so wide. They've got, they've got two wingers, uh, Grabowski on one side and, and Held on the other, who, who, and when they come in, someone else goes out wide. So they're making the pitch as big as possible, uh, like, like the Dutch did. And then they just play between the England players in, in the spaces, tippity-tap, tippity-tap, tippity-tap. And there are periods in the, in the first half where they have the ball for ages and England are running around chasing them. And it's, it's, a, it's that total conception of football where as long as the team keeps its shape, a player can crop up anywhere. And Breitner is kind of nominally the left-sided defender. But he's, he's everywhere. He, you know, he, he'll, he'll crop up in the inside right position. As long as someone is keeping the pitch wide and someone is protecting the, is protecting the space that he leaves behind, he can roam all over. So the, the Germans in possession, they are just so fluid and the ball moves beautifully and as I say they don't actually create that many chances I can't really remember that many saves that, that that Gordon Banks has to make there are a few but not that many but what what really struck people was was the fluidity of the football and England have a lot of pressure and there are times when England are, are hanging on for, for for grim life but I think what you see here is that Ramsey's side that won the World Cup in 66 was built for Bobby Charlton. And that 4-4-2, and Charlton is, is, is himself has even referred to it as 4-3-3, seeing himself as, as one of the strikers. Because with, with the other three midfielders, he's got total platform to come forward. And, and what he did so well was the shooting from you know, 20, 30, 30 yards. And what you see here is England without Bobby Charlton. Mm. And it doesn't quite work. And the strikers don't really have much of a much of a relationship between them. 
But the idea that the strikers is, you know, you, 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 you play the long diagonal to a striker at the far post and he nods it down or nods it across. Now, before they would be laying back to Bobby Charlton and Charlton would, would, would be arriving to shoot and England haven't replaced Bobby Charlton. And Alan Ball gets in those positions a few times, but shooting was the worst part of, of his game. That's not what he did. Colin Bell gets in those positions once or twice, but again, he, he's not Bobby Charlton. So uh, I was, the, the surprise that I had watching it was just how close England pushed the Germans and how much they even could have won. You know, barring an, an individual mistake here and there, they actually could have won the game. Although the Germans are playing a, a, a brand of football, which... Is is light years ahead of, of what England are, England are doing. So it's it's a fascinating game. You can see the whole thing on on, on YouTube. I would I would advise it, it, it's a good way to spend an hour and a half. I think going back on in a, in a time tunnel to uh, 28, 29th of of April nineteen seventy two. That was such a good analysis of the game, which I have watched and you've watched again um, <clears throat> over the last week. And it is, I mean, you football pundits do earn your corn when you give uh, a breakdown like that of uh, a great match, because everything you've said, um, I kind of saw, but you've accentuated the impact of those little moments in the game for me. Um, totally right. I I'll say very quickly, I don't agree that England could have won the game. I do agree that they should have scored first because there was a little scramble in the German penalty area, which is a real proper, you know, um, pinball <laughs> ding dong for a while. You thought the ball's going to go, it's got to go in, it's got to go in, it's got to go in. And it's, it just a, it's shows... a pinball ding dong. There has to be a twist. And the twist is that England don't score. They don't score. This, this is the problem. And from that moment on, I think the Germans were much more composed. They saw what could have happened with the old style of uh, England football that they were facing. Another thing is that although Gordon Banks doesn't make many saves and he doesn't, or he, he doesn't need to work that hard from uh, the German attack, and although um, Germany is not creating a lot, they are around and about the England penalty area quite a lot. Yeah. And if it wasn't for the hard work of Norman Hunter, it could have been more than just 3-1, the result here, because he was, and you knew that there was a problem when you've got a central defender that's working that hard. He seemed to have to play for two or three people, just because, like you said, the Germans were popping up all yeah. over the place, um, centrally and on the wing and everything like that. He seemed to be everywhere. And you thought, wow, without him, the ball has just gone in the back of the net. Germans didn't have to create that much. Well, this was one of the problems that England had in selection. They, 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 used, they always played Bobby Moore and a, a centre-half, centre-half. You know, it was Jack Charlton in 66. It was LeBone, Brian LeBone of Everton in 70. And then it was Roy McFarland of Derby. McFarland pulls out injured. A lot of people think Clough didn't get a, a shot at the England job because he was doing doing that kind of thing with his, with, his, with his players. Uh, and uh, so what they decided was they would play Moore and Hunter together. Now, that's two quite similar types of players. They never did that. And that's been one of the things that's been blamed on the England defeat. Looking at the game again, I don't blame the defeat on the lack of a big stopper centre-half. Because Germany didn't come with a, you know, that kind of centre-half wouldn't stop Gert Müller, who was little and mobile and so on. However, there's a problem in Hunter and Moore together. They don't really know each other. And to accommodate Hunter, Moore moves sides. He usually plays on the left. Now he comes in onto the right. And that is directly responsible for the first goal. Because he intercepts a cross... And he turns, as he would usually do, he turns on towards his left and inside. Now, had he been playing on the left side of defence as normal, that would have taken him away from goal and out of trouble. Instead, it takes him towards goal and he loses the ball. Muller gets a foot in and they tee up Uli Hernis for the goal. So that, that, that was playing more on that side was a problem. And it's then a problem with the decisive goal, which is the second goal. England have just equalised. Francis Lee has, 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 has put one in after a shot from, from, from Colin Bell. Uh, and uh, it's a mistake from the right back, Maiderly. 
this was another in injury problem that England had. Terry Cooper, the left back, pulled out injured. So that meant that Emlyn Hughes went to play on the left. He's got no left foot. He's all he's all right foot. He does attack a lot, and he does he, he does commit the German defence. And in, in, in his kind of rock, quite harebrained, crazy horse way, he does cause problems to, to the German defence. But he's on the on his wrong side. Paul Maidley comes in on the other side, and he doesn't have a he doesn't add a great deal attacking. But here he makes a bad mistake. He he, uh, he gets half a foot, and the ball goes loose, and it's more against Siggy against the winger Siggy Held. Again, more on this right side of the defence where he's uncomfortable. And Moore does what Moore never did. He goes to ground to try and make a tackle. He always said that this was ignorance. He never did it. And he did it here. And there was no need to do it because Hunter, as you say, Hunter was everywhere. Hunter was covering. So even had Moore been beaten, Hunter was there to cover. But more, although the first contact is outside the area. Yeah, uh, that was a, a suspicious one for me. But sorry, go on. Yeah, I, mean, I always think in that situation, my sympathy is with the, the attacker. If, there's, if, if the first contact is outside, but the contact carries on inside the area, for me, morally at least, that, 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 that's a penalty. Mm. So I don't have any, any real complaints with, with, with the decision. But anyway, and Banks saves the penalty. But he just pushes it onto the post. He gets that, two hands oh, onto it. He's such he a good, great it, goalkeeper. He just couldn't it keep post. it out. Yeah, because he then handles third, it. Yeah, yeah. It, it wasn't just like the tip of his fingers. He handles no. it properly, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah. his palms, the two yeah. hands, and, and just a fraction more, and he, he gets that round. And then the third goal straight afterwards is the result of Emmy Hughes playing on the wrong side because England are in a hurry. They need to equalise. Banks throws the ball out to him quickly in the left back position. And uh, if he was left-footed, he'd just go outside. But he, he wants to get it onto his old swing at a right foot. So he comes inside and he gets caught. He loses the ball. And the, then the, the, the Germans set up Muller for just a fantastic finish. Oh, yeah. Clinical. Clinical. Jimmy Greaves. Yeah, 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 yeah. I could see that. You don't that. have to burst the back of the neck. That. You just have yeah. to get it over the line. Of course, yeah. But it was clinical. It couldn't have gone in any closer no. to the post. So Gordon Banks had very little chance in saving that. I, I, my argument would be that Gerd Muller would have a good shout for being the man of the match, actually. Um, not just because he set up one and scored one, but also because he... You know, going back to that, what you said about total football, he was all over the place. He was in midfield more than he yeah, was yeah. at, at the forward. Everyone gave it to Gunter Netzer at the time, oh. who who uh, it was seen as his great game. He flattered to deceive afterwards. He he wasn't an integral part of the German side that won the World Cup two years later. Mm -hmm. uh, and that it was another thing that Ramsey was criticised for, for not picking a, a marker in midfield. You know, he usually had Nobby Styles or Alan Mullery. And he went with a ball playing midfield and he was criticised for that. But watching the match, I think Germany was so fluid that even had he gone with that type of that type of player, they'd, just have, they, they'd have played around him. I didn't actually, watching it again, I didn't think Netzer was as good as a lot of the, the contemporary reports thought. Mm. And he, he, he sets up Muller for, for one chance uh, and he, he has quite a lot of the ball and he is very good. But I, I don't think he, he he tipped the balance in the game. He had a lot of space and he and he, he knocked the ball around well and lost it very very few times. Uh, in the because uh, this is not all over. England have lost three one, but they can go to Germany for the second leg and and, and win four one. Hard. Yeah, but well, on yeah, well, in the end, helpful. what Ramsey did, he just he just picked a team of cloggers and they kicked the shit out of the Germans. You know, mm. uh, I think Netzer said after that game, the 11 Englishmen have all autographed my shins. <laughs> so I think Peter story of Arsenal came in for that one and, uh, and, and, and kicked a few. Uh, and it was a, it was a nil nil draw. Um, but it's the end of England, isn't it? It's the moment that England are no, le no longer, the very top rank. We haven't been the top rank before. We were the top rank in 1970. So many of the Brazilian players from that that team said we won. The, they've told me we won the World Cup when we beat England one 0 Yeah, I, 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 I could see them saying that. Uh, Netzer was part of a midfield trio, though. There was Honus and Vimmer as well that we shouldn't forget. And yeah, well, there were a few in, there were injury worries for the Germans because they had a fellow who was who was uh, always in the team over mm. that. He's injured. So they got improvised here and there. But you look at Hernis was a kid. He's only just, I think, he, I think he played in the Olympics that year, I think. I think he was still an amateur. 
But it looked a... like they were playing together, whereas yes. the England midfield didn't look like they'd ever played together before. You know, they were just doing their own thing. And the great football writer Hugh McIlvenny in The Observer the next day, because this match was on a Saturday, so in The Observer, and he does do a real good analysis of the match in The Observer the next day. What he says, he starts off by saying that what Alf Ramsey did wrong was he picked a midfield who were known for what they could do with the ball, whereas he should have picked a midfield, or at least one or two of those players in midfield should have been known for what they could do to retrieve the ball from the opponents. Yeah, see, it's that that not picking a Nobby Styles, Alan Mullery type figure. I, watching the game again, I don't necessarily agree. Because as I say, I think that what the Germans were doing was something we'd never seen before uh, at international level, uh, making the pitch that big. So imagine that there's a there's a mar there's a man marker on that set. They just play around him because they made the pitch so big and they were so fluid that they're constantly creating two against one situations. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm, that was everyone's conception at the time. I'm not sure I agree. But what what difference does it make though to a match when you take those two sides of um, the midfield creativity? On the one hand, you've got players who seem to be the ones that are more in value in today's football market, certainly in the Premier League, who are creative with the ball rather than what they can do without the ball. I mean, you look at Kevin De Bruyne. Uh, arguably the, the best fit midfielder in the Premier League. Certainly, you know, that's what the pundits think over and over again. When he loses the ball, trying to get the ball off the other side, I'm not so sure that he's very valuable in that respect. You know, they need uh, somebody else. Um, what's a Brazilian that Man City have got? In, in Yeah, it, they need him to really take the ball off somebody and very quickly as well. So, but what, what difference does it make to a match? I don't see... On the one hand, I can understand why you need elements of both, but I can't understand why you would um, favour one side of that uh, divide over another. Well, the big counter argument to the view that England made a mistake by not having a specialist ball winner is that Germany didn't have one. No, Herbert v Wimmer is, is a little bit of that. And Wimmer has fantastic lung power. That's what he, he, he does the running for Gunther Netzer. And the two of them play together at the same, in, in Borussia Mönchengladbach. So they know each other well. So that's a little partnership there. Wimmer's there to do the running for, for Netzer. But he's, you see him, him cropping up on the wing. You know, you see him cropping up all over the place. So they don't have a specialist ball winner. Perhaps, see, all of this was so new that maybe McIlvany has missed the big point, and McIlvany is my idol as a football writer, but the big point is there are, there are no, almost no specialists. If you, if, if you get, it's like, it's, it's like Guardiola's dream, a team of 11 midfielders. Uh, now, clearly you need one specialist to be in goal, and you need, and they, they have Schwarzenbeck, who is the, the specialist defender, Hodges is a, is a little bit as well. There, although Hodges will, will, will go wide and, uh, and and start moves from the back. But it's a lesson that I learned when England in the 1990 World Cup, when England played the Germans in, in, the, in the, the, the semi-final. And the, the, the England midfield was Waddle, Platt and Gascoigne. And Platt at that time was very much an attacking midfielder. He went deeper later on, but he was an attacking midfielder. And before the game, I thought we're going to we're going to get slaughtered in midfield here. And the lesson I and we didn't. And the lesson I learned was, if everyone just gets back and fills space, you don't necessarily have so much need of that specialist. And it depends how, how you how you, you you set your teams up. And if you want to free both of your fullbacks to bomb forward, then you really do need someone who's going to stay and and and, and hold the fort. A little bit um, but I, I think the lesson of the total football played here by West Germany and by Holland is your team is made up of 11 footballers and you want them all to be able to to play in any situation that they find themselves inside the game um, it, it was the old it's almost like a like a, a Ford factory line conception that traditionally English football had 
He is the winger. He stays wide. He gets the ball. He crosses to the centre forward. The centre forward. You know, everyone has a role on the production line. And here with the with, with the Germans and what the Dutch are doing, we're looking at a at a more holistic thing where anyone can can do any function. Uh, and uh, that that is the root of the fluidity of the German football. That's how we played football at school, obviously. Yeah. Everybody just yeah. ran after the ball. Yes. But if it was so great, why doesn't everybody play like that? Because it's, it, it did seem to... I mean, you talk of Pep Guardiola. He's not entirely total football, though. He does have uh, specialists within his team as well. Why doesn't everybody play like that if it is so successful, if it's so uh, powerful? Uh, uh, well, at if, if you're the weaker side, if you don't have the money of, of, a, of a Man City, for example, you've got to set up your side to deal with them. So you're going to set up your side to defend first. So you're going to think, right, I want to stop. All right, I want to stop Gerd Müller. We're playing Germany. I want, I'm going to stop Gerd Müller. So I'm going to have that specialist stopping him and another specialist covering. Uh, we want to have someone cracking down on Netzer in midfield. And this is what uh, Mourinho has often done he constructs his side based on the opposition and then he works will work back from the opposition on what the West Germans what the, 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 the total football is saying is we're, we're going to play our way no matter what happens this is our idea of play and we're, that, that's what we're, we're going to do well you can either say well we're going to respond with, with our own idea and we're going to go toe to toe in a boxing match but if you think the, the, the other fella has a stronger punch you, you, you're not going to, you know, you, you're going to cover up first because that's one of the great things about football. You can win it in so many different ways. You can win it by covering up and seizing your moment. Yeah, in the Guardian on the day, April the 29th, this is the preview of the match in the Guardian by Albert Barham. Um, he says Sir Alf has basically gone with the tried and trusted men um i suppose going back to 1966 he adds this is the sixth meeting of the two countries in six seasons but only two of those matches need to be remembered we know the 4-2 victory in the world cup at wembley of course but also the 3-2 defeat at leon in the 1970 world cup quarterfinals uh, this is the decider yeah. and most important match played at Wembley by England since the final of 1966, which echoes your thoughts uh, yeah. there, Tim, as well. The team winning this time tonight probably wins a place in the semi-finals. and England's additional incentive is that the final stages of this competition will be in England if they go through. So they had the incentive there. Uh, but they didn't have the midfield. You mentioned Mullery before. Albert Barham goes on to say in midfield, there could well be the return of Mullery showing all his old drive in the Spurs side in European club competition. His injury and loan to Fulham at one point suggested an end to uh, all first class and international aspirations with every player conscious that he must obey Sir Alf's tactical instructions. One would expect England to start with Mullery, Ball and Peters in midfield and Bell Chivers and Hurst in the attack. It would be no surprise to see Marsh, who was not in the original squad, added to it in or add to his seven minutes of international experience late in this game, or if the Germans' defense is proving especially difficult. Yeah. What about the addition of Rodney Marsh? He well, could have done something there as a creative player, at least. But he came on, and there's there's one moment when you see the greatness of Beckenbauer as a, as a defender. Because there's one moment when he turns his defender, Marsh turns his defender, and you think he's in, and then Beckenbauer, the sweeper, just comes along and elegantly takes the ball away from him, like a, like an old-fashioned schoolmaster schooling an errant pupil. Um, so uh, that, that's a that's a decisive moment in in, in the game as well. Uh, yeah. One of those, one of those. But the, the difference from the starting lineup there mentioned by Mr. Barham was that Lee played. So he went with three up front. He went with with uh, Hurst, Chivers, and Lee. Uh, maybe he wanted uh, he wanted to sing "Welcome Home" and have Peters and Lee in the side, you know. Mm. But I don't really think Alf Ramsey was was a was a Peters and Lee. Can you imagine Alf Ramsey as a Peters and Lee fan? Um, welcome home, <laughs> welcome. You put it on the spot, and I have to bang them in. You've been gone too long. 
But this is the end of Sir Alf Ramsey's reign, isn't it? This no, is... no. He, he, well, he, almost. He, he, I was yeah. thinking sort of more He's got the 1974 World Cup. Of course, of course. Uh, but and... there's a couple of things. Like Barham says here, the, the fact that you had to obey that old school way, but you have to obey every single thing that the uh, coach says, rather than take the initiative on the field. But also in this ongoing battle with the German coach, Schoen, uh, clearly who has shown the future rather than harking back to the past um, with players like Grabowski, for example. I mean, England had wingers like that, but we didn't use them yeah. at this point. It does seem to me as if this is the end of the philosophy, certainly that won England the World Cup in 1966. Yeah, right? yeah. It, it also starts the wilderness years, doesn't it, really? I mean, for most of the 70s, England were dreadful. Uh and after Ramsey went, I mean, we, I remember thinking, yeah, Don Revy, winner, and so on. And England were a shambles. There, were, there just seemed to be no idea of a team for a year. And the image I have in my head of, of England from that time is of everyone rushing around and everyone just getting there too late. Uh, and we were off the pace set by the Germans here. I'm glad you mentioned the winger there, Grabowski, because... I think this is this is a key, a key conceptual point in how you set up your team. Ramsey had done away with a specialist winger. Now he'd played in '66. He played ball on one wing and, and and pieces on the other, and they'd done the work of wingers, but they'd also funnel back. So he got kind of two players out of one, and he then he got rid of wingers. For this game, neither of them are wingers, and ball plays centrally. And because there's only three in midfield, they can't be they can't be wingers. So now he, he's expecting the fullbacks to provide the width. But Maidley isn't an attacking fullback, and Hughes on the left is all right footed. So one of the prime differences between the teams is that the Germans have wingers, but they don't have wingers who you know Stanley Matthews style who just stand on the touchline and wait for the ball to come. They have wingers who will move in. And someone else will take their space. They have wingers who are who are involved in the flow of the play. They have wingers who are who are who are inside forwards. Um, so, from a conceptual point of view, they're keeping the pitch big, wide with wingers, whereas England were trying to and not succeeding with fullbacks. I'm so glad you mentioned Don Revy or Revy, as I call him. Um, you're probably right, and I'm wrong, obviously. But I'm so glad that you mentioned him, the Leeds manager at the time, uh, because, first of all, there's the boss who's right behind us. He's the one who fills our hearts with pride. It's a joy to us all when Big Jack has the ball to know that he is on our side. Oh, and there's this, a, this Leeds United. <laughs> there's a red-headed tiger known as Billy, and he goes like a human <laughs> dynamo. Mick, the mover, of course, he can work like a horse, and Top Cat Cooper's always on the go. And we play all the way for Leeds United. Elland Road is the only place for us. With heart and soul for the goal that's clearly sighted, we're out to toast each other from that silver cup. They're number 31 in the charts on April the 29th, 1972. And that's their FA Cup final record. Because mm. they're about to play Arsenal in the FA Cup final. But there's another football record in there that has even more resonance, but I don't think it's, it's associated with any particular game, is it? It's Chelsea's blue are the colour. Blue is the colour. That is the one that has been remembered over time, yeah. even though uh, it seems so far away. It seems to be in the era of Bobby Tamblin and Peter Osgood and uh, everybody else. But that is the one that's remembered only because it's less complicated than, yes. you know, we play all the way for Leeds United, yeah. Ellen Road is the home. And that's also, the, the Leeds one is like a nursery rhyme. That's why I read it out like that. You know, you should see how he runs Speedy Reedy when Iron Man Hunter sends it down the wing. That's just a bit too complicated. Blue is the yeah. colour, football is the game, we're all together, whatever it is. Well, that is much more memorable than... I'm sorry, and that will live forever. They used it as an advert for Esso Blue Paraffin. I don't know if you remember this. Uh, there were two types of paraffin at the time, and I used to 
get the unfortunate job of having to go sort of half a mile down the road to uh, the petrol station, which in those days was in the heart of a very secluded residential area, a petrol station on the back streets of Tottenham, where all you see are residential houses, maybe a little corner shop, but literally a corner shop, which is a corner house, but the living room has been turned into a shop. It was that kind of an area. And we, we, we had a petrol station there and there were two types of paraffin. You either got the pink one or the blue one. Absolutely no difference, obviously, but the blue one won out because they had a song to go with it. Blue is the car liar, SO is the name, <laughs> whatever it was. Yeah, mate, that's all the other reasons. But yeah, two football songs in the charts. At number one in the charts, is a song that has a kind of a football resonance in its football, sorry, in its gospel roots. So that's the Royal Scots Dragoon Guard um, with Amazing Grace, obviously an instrumental with lots of bagpipes and everything like that, the kind of tune that you could hear at an FA Cup final. Not quite that though, because of course its roots are in enslavement amongst other things. But there aren't a lot of tunes that are written for bagpipes, there are very few. In fact, that was one of the reasons why um, Paul McCartney wrote Mull of Kintyre, because you know all these people that played bagpipes when he was living up on the Mull of Kintyre um, off the coast of Scotland, uh, all of these people that played bagpipes say, you know, why don't you write a tune for us? Because you know the only tunes we're able to play are these handful of tunes um, on on Princes Street in Edinburgh uh, as we go busking or whatever. You know, you write a tune for us. So he wrote Mull of Kintyre for the bagpipes, and they do play it. That's one of the most modern bagpipe tunes there are. But what I wanted to say about the charts comes in a moment. Tell me first of all about this, what you thought of this version of Amazing Grace, because I, I, I mean, it's an incredible song in any case with a lot of power. I never knew, I never thought that it would work so well with bagpipes, but it's almost as if it was written for bagpipes. Yeah, 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 you're right. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking now, what would Bo Diddley sound like on bag on bagpipes? <laughs> and it, it's a point I make because when you look at this chart, yeah. Bo Diddley is all over it. Oh, in terms of rhythm, yeah. In terms of yeah, the Bo Diddley beat, yeah. Dum 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 dum. -dum, -dum. I never thought of that. Okay. Because th th this this is a year. This is a uh, this is this is it's a groundbreaking moment we're talking about, and the little pixie has kicked the door open. And that's Mark, Mark Boland with, with T-Rex. It's very, very T-Rex. It is. It? This. It's, this is one of the best things he's done, but I never thought of Bo Diddley in this context, particularly because- Well, bec because, I mean, there's a, there's a, a T-Rex song in the charts, um, Deborah. Deborah, yeah. That's a kind of cash in. Mm. He'd done that in 68 when he was still Tyrannosaurus Rex. Yeah, yeah. And it, it, it's still a little a little bit folky dokey dokey, you know, away with the fairies. Yeah. And then he's he's come back, you know, in in in, in 70, starting with Rider White Rider White Swan. And it, it's pared down rock and roll, isn't it? Hooks, get it on, bang a gong, get it on. Quick hooks. It's very, very rock and roll Bo Diddley, isn't it? Mm. And uh they have just taken over the nation, T-Rex. So much so that the number two show, song in, in, in the charts is Ringo Starr, Back Off Boogaloo, co-written with, with, with George Harrison, doing a T-Rex. That's what they're doing. And Boogaloo was apparently, it was a phrase that Mark Boland used to use all the time. And, and, and Ringo Starr was really, really into them. Uh, and you can see why, you know, if you've grown up as a greaser, you know, in late 50s, 60s, you know. That's what Ringo Starr you, was. Yeah, yes. He was a steady boy, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. You just see the, mm. the, 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 the connection. Mm. So, uh, you know, um, Ringo Starr took it seriously for a while, didn't he? This is, I think this is maybe his second hit. I the thought this was the best one. This is one that I remember. I, a, I prefer the first one, which is uh, It Don't Come Easy. Got to okay, pay yeah. Jews if you want yeah. to sing the blues, and you know, yeah. Which, yeah. which which just has George Harrison written all over it. Mm -hmm. he, he didn't take a writing credit until after his death, I think, much, much later. But it was like Harrison trying to help Ringo out, mm -hmm. and Ringo's obviously taking it seriously because it, it's the straight ahead rock and roll that he grew up on and 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 he, and he loves. 
Uh, but again, it, it's a little pixie. It's T-Rex kicking open the door. Uh, and if you go through this chart, there's this, I mean, uh, I think, I think an American band, Joe, Joe gun. Yep. Yep. Run, and run, run. They, they sound like the deep South. They sound yes. like, you know, Leonard Skinner on heat as it were. Yeah, uh, on, the, the, on the English English size, it was status quo and it's the kind of straight, Indeed. Oogie, although woogie, woogie, although woogie, 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 I think they're more authentic than state. Well, I shouldn't say that because status quo have got an authentic riff that they milk, but um, they're more, uh, what, what's the word, uh, organic maybe than status quo for me. Anyway, Jojo Run. And for us kids, it was just the alliteration that worked, you know, Run, Run, Run by Jojo Gun. You know, we loved all of that. And that's why I remember it. Otherwise, this would have been a forgotten tune, I think. The uh, b behind them, uh, Marmalade. It's, oh, it's that's a, a rubbish tune, though. Isn't it? Yeah, but again, it's yeah. it's an attempt to do Bo Diddley. It, it, mm, it, it's mm. it's that kind of rhythm, and you've just got coming up in the charts, Tumbling Dice, yep. which is the stone single off yep. uh, off of Exile in Main Street. That is so bluesy. I mean, th this must be after they met Muddy Waters in Chicago because that's just got chess records written all over it. See what I don't understand about them is that th these are it's a group of English kids in tax exile in the south of France, mm -hmm. and it just sounds so American, doesn't it? Tumbling dice. Well, it's American, but I think there's some English about it. Yeah, that whole Exile on Main Street album was very American. Even the title, Exile on Main Street. Where's Main Street? It's in the states. We don't call our high streets Main Street. You know, um, it it was a a very American uh, album. But I, you know, maybe it's in the drumming and there's some amazing drumming Perhaps. on this track that makes it a little bit more English. And I think they found, they navigated their way into the blues at a time when a lot of African-Americans had moved on to soul music. So blues wasn't really developing. Blues was a retro music by this point. So early, yeah, 1972. I'm not saying that there aren't some great blues artists that came subsequently, because of course the great Taj Mahal, you could argue, um, you know, was one of the great blues artists and still around today that came subsequently. But for the most part, blues had become a retro music, whereas the English boys or the British contingent were still finding little nuances in blues that they could exploit for, a, you know, a, a much wider or European based audience. I found the, this chance to be one of the most melodious. I think you mentioned a hook a moment or two ago when you were talking about T-Rex. I think this is what typifies this time of music or certainly this chance that we're talking about. Uh, you, every single one of the tunes seems to be, or every other one of the tunes seems to be something of an earthworm, you know, Without You by Nielsen. I know it gets a lot of stick now because it, it's so, um, you know, so common to hear this, it's all over the place, but it's actually the fact, because there ain't much of a lyric to it, there ain't a huge amount of lyric to it, but it's the fact that the the melody is unforgettable once you um, get it. Vicky Leandros, Come What May, gorgeous, Eurovision. Rock, by the way. Yeah, Eurovi well, there's a couple of Eurovision tunes in this one, you know, and we'll come on to that in just a moment, but Vicky Leandros, uh, come what may. Uh, well, she's gorgeous woman, is what I wanted to say. Absolutely gorgeous. And I think that's what I remember most, being about 12 years old at this time, that she was gorgeous. And then when I saw the videos again on YouTube, I thought, yeah, yeah, you, you had a little bit of a taste as a young boy, even <laughs> though, you know, you didn't know a single girl in those days or anything like that. You mentioned Eurovision. One thing that stands out for me in this Eurovision, I mean, it's not one of the better songs in the charts, but nevertheless, it's really important to look. If people have a chance, just look at the new Seekers Eurovision oh, Song Contest right. entry, Beg, Steal or Borrow, because this is before, this is a couple of years before ABBA. ABBA yeah, must have watched yeah. that and thought, oh, God, yeah. that's yeah. what we're gonna do. That's the that is, we yeah. know how to do that better than they do. I mean, the song may as well have been an ABBA tune, Beg, Steal or Borrow. I can hear money, 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 yeah, yeah. money. If we do Beg, Steal or Borrow. And I've never thought about that before. I don't spend a lot of time thinking about ABBA, but you, you know, you're, well, you're, you're right on. I spent less time thinking about the I new doubt it. 
No, no, thinking about the new seekers. <laughs> Apart from, you know, I like to teach the world to see. Well, you do your best. I know I do do my best. Of course I do my best. And I used to love Coke, drinking Coke in those days. Other uh, rotten teeth uh, pop is available. But no, genuinely, when I, I could not believe it when I watched it. And I thought, my God, they must have sat, when they saw ABBA win the Eurovision Song Contest two years later, they must have thought, they've just copied us. But what ABBA did, the difference was ABBA turned it into a formula. When Beg Silo Borrow comes out, the lead singer is one of the men in the New Seekers rather than one of the women or, you know, two of the women singing and the men staying in the background. So Abba made it, made, or made it much of a construct. We'll have two women at the front. The men will always stay in the background. It's almost like the formation on a football pitch when your <laughs> manager says to you, look, stay in defence. I don't want you running up the field. This is what Alf Ramsey used to hate about some of the other um, defenders that he had, that they like to so run So the, the, the new seekers are going for kind of total football style fluidity where everyone yes. can crop up as a lead seeker. Yes, um, whereas and, Abba uh, going yeah. for the tried and trusted 4-4-2. Yeah. You know, four uh, in the band, four in the title of the band, and two women up front. That's the way it is, mate. And um, and and then there's one more Eurovision Song Contest entry, of course, as well. Uh, what was that in the charts? Do you remember? Although no. middle of no middle of the road wasn't a Eurovision Song Contest um, entry, but it was again slightly the formula that ABBA would pursue afterwards, although they've only got one woman. But you could see the, the beginnings of what ABBA would take from British pop music and think we can do better than that and we can really sell it and package it and hone our skills on this and turn it into a... Um... What, what I want to put past you, Johnny Nash, stir it up. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Now, because I think a lot of people grew up with the idea that Bob Marley was the first reggae artist mm -hmm. and a first to, 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 to make it popular. And mm -hmm. that's not really true, is it? I mean, there were, there were, there were reggae, there, were, there was lots of kind of reggae and proto-reggae around mm -hmm. in the UK charts, late 60s, early 70s. Well, we might get a chance to talk about Greyhound in a moment or two, um, who were an incredible British reggae band that perhaps have been forgotten about by a lot of people, but not forgotten about by uh, young black kids growing up in Britain at the time like me, because these were our heroes, because, you know, they were the first people from over here that were breaking into the charts. Well, Labby Sifri as well, in a different kind of thing. But we weren't listening to Labby Sifri at the youth, in the youth clubs at the time. We were listening to uh, people like Greyhound. We'll come on to that in a second. Remember, Stir It Up is a Bob Marley track. So what happened in the early 70s, late 60s, early 70s, the Bob Marley's manager at that time was a guy called Danny Sims. Some of a bad boy reputation in management, but he was also the manager of Johnny Nash. Important, really important. So in the early 70s, Danny Sims convinced uh, Bob Marley, it was to do with a film, there was a film tie in here, there was a film soundtrack that needed to be written and um, a Hollywood film soundtrack, and they were like um, trying to recruit Bob Marley to come on and go off and write songs with Johnny Nash for it. So Bob Marley lived for a time in Sweden, in Stockholm, writing songs for Johnny Nash. He was like, uh, I don't know if the film was being made in Sweden or whether he was just over there uh, touring or whatever it was, but he, he lived there for some time. And he was essentially a member of uh, Johnny Nash's band there is a video i've seen of johnny nash going to a school with kids in it and you know just like to sing some of his songs or to encourage the kids or whatever the guitarist that he's got with him is a very young uh, bob marley playing acoustic guitar for him so johnny nash and bob marley were together for a while but i'll tell you what is really significant about this when i listen back to it and you know johnny nash's stir it up is a tune that i grew up with as much as i can see clearly now or any other tune by johnny nash hold me tight and so on when i listen now and what i did was listen to johnny nash and then listen to the bob marley this is an education in what pop music is. You know, pop is one of those catch-all phrases that it's hard to define because pop can come in all shapes and sizes. It can come in rock, it can come in reggae, it can come in jazz to a certain extent. So what is it then? What would you encapsulate with the term pop? Well, what you do is 
first of all, beef it up a little bit, you know, make it a little bit jolly, make it a little bit jolly, have a bass line that is playing all the sort of brighter notes rather than the, um, you know, more sort of down tone um, bluesy notes. Have a singer with a voice that is um, unthreatening and very upbeat, upbeat voice. That is essentially what pop is. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't work all the time because you'll get somebody like uh, Gilbert O'Sullivan, who's in the charts with Alone Again Naturally, singing a very depressing song and singing on a downward. But his voice is still somewhat mellifluous, if you like. Yeah. When you listen to Bob Marley's version, and what I did was listen to them back to back. So I listened to Stir It Up, Johnny Nash's version. Then I listened to Bob Marley's. In fact, the live session, uh, famously on Old Grey Whistle Test, the best live session, the Whalers, as they were originally with Bunny Whaler, the late great Bunny Whaler as he is now, and uh, Peter Tosh at the forefront, and the Barrett brothers on rhythm, uh, Carlton Barrett, uh, late great again, uh, shot dead for no reason. Uh, well, something about, uh, you know, his, his wife having an affair with somebody else, apparently. But anyway, Carly Barrett on drums, Aston Family Barrett on bass. And it starts off much more bluesy. Much more. It starts off actually with Peter Tosh's invention, which is the reggae chop. That was what Peter Tosh invented for reggae. Chicken, chicken. And then it comes up with this amazing bass line because this wasn't the original stir it up the original stir it up they're done in the 60s with lee perry and you know it's got all horns it's more jazzy and blah 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 now the key ingredient for stir it up for bob marley is that bass line and aston family barrett who had come out of uh, the alpha boy school band i seem to remember which is a famous orphanage in jamaica um they taught their pupils to play jazz essentially marching band jazz and this kind of thing that's what alpha uh, school did with um, a woman a nun called uh, saint mary ignatius as i remember she's dead now but i remember doing the obituary on her and learning a lot about what she did for alpha boy school and uh, speaking to rica rodriguez at the time about her going to his um, little flat on the housing estate in wandsworth um, and basically what bob marley does here is very threatening stir it up as he does it's a love song but believe me when you hear bob marley sing it it's kind of like this is a revolutionary love song there ain't going to be no party they take it doom 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 that's the bass line but you think it's going to be joyful then you hear bob marley's voice singing stir it up little darling stir it up whereas johnny nash a couple of years later or earlier is singing stir it up little darling stir it up you, you did this same great analysis with bill haley did i yeah <laughs> exactly uh, a couple of weeks ago what yeah how <laughs> the original is made pop ah, exactly. uh, and just how that that light touch the lightness of it Almost singing it with a smile. Yes. So the, the original, right. the original has a has a threat, as a menace, and then you just lighten it up, and that that's that's part of of, of the way towards pop. I think you're right. It all comes from no, Sam Cooke. No, you're Cook. right. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> it all comes from <laughs> Sam Cooke. It all comes from Sam Cooke. The way that they sing it, and yeah. that's why you can have these songs of heartache sound like you know you've got to get it in your collection and play it at the local youth club or the disco as it was in those days um this is such an amazing chart i can't tell you every single one of the even beautiful sunday daniel boone do you remember that no i That's, don't oh you no. don't remember that was one of those no. tunes that you know everybody used to just say i never even knew what it meant but it was just like the hook that got you this isn't a chart full of hooks there, there, there are so many that have that have, st that have past the test of time even if i don't like them you know yeah, like yeah. heart of gold neil young which, yeah oh, i don't really yeah. like it but it, uh, uh rocket man elton john yeah meet me on the corner lindisfarne a lovely yeah. little melody yeah. you know yeah. a lot of the you're, you're right i think on the chart for melody but things are just about to change the day before this match 
Starman by David Bowie is, is released. Yeah. Now, it's a slow burner. Many people rate the day that he was on top of the pops doing it, which is a couple of months later. It takes a while to build up momentum, this record. It's his big breakthrough record. Many people rate that that on top of the pops as a as, a, as an epoch shaking moment. It's not for me. I've always been immune to him. I, I kind of got more respect for him after he died. At the time, it didn't really mean anything to me. I know you're different. Take it away. Well, I would say things have already changed. Things have already changed, and not because um, Elton John beats him to the stargazing with Rocket Man. But because if you look at the papers at this time, so we're talking about April the 29th, 1972. What's in the papers is Vietnam. Vietnam is still going on. And remember, America has been consumed by Vietnam and American artists have been consumed by Vietnam for a few years at this point. But it's never, it's been um, something of a difficult, topic for English artists to engage in, uh, not least because a lot of the tunes that they're still playing at this point are, you know, what we call dance tunes or pop tunes or disco tunes or whatever it is. But what's happening in the disco era, remember Marvin Gaye has still not come out yet with, uh, with um, what's going on at this point, or does it come out? No, I, th I think that's earlier. I think it's about 70. So, 1970, okay then, apologies. Well, um, Marvin Gaye has come out earlier than that, but he's still quite a lot on his own. I think James Brown did that King Heroin sort of around that time. So and, the game- Curtis is, Mayfield is also, is also going there, you know, this back is to true. the world and so on. This is true. Although I would argue that it's not until the Temptations take a look around them that you realize whoa and it's it's an uncomfortable tune to listen to because this is not the temptation's natural ground you know here they are in the charts at number 23 well, it, 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 there's a lot of problems within the group about of that, course you know because norman whitfield's taken them into territory what one of the you know was it cloud nine they got to sing my father didn't know the meaning of work <laughs> None of them wanted to sing that line. No. That's horrible, man. That's horrible. That is horrible. He mistreated mother and treated her like dirt. You know, you're going to sing that? That is horrible. But the point I'm trying to make, though, is there are already these reflections coming through from places that you wouldn't have expected them to come through um, in the pop charts, in the American um, dance charts, if you like, or, you know, what was known as soul is now becoming the soul of the world, you know, the soul of the human condition rather than the just uh, soul music. And what you're seeing already, and, and I, I think, to be honest, David Bowie's star man and um, a lot of his music at this point is more kind of reflections on humanity, if that makes sense. And I think that's... This is one of the things I've, I, I've, I've never really understood what it's all about. When I get the thing with Bowie, that there is in it, there is the, the possibility of, in urban life, of self-recreation. I get that. But I've always, the, the, the kind of distance that he has... Now, the fact that he's singing through characters at the start, you know, it, it puts a distance between him and, him and the music. Uh, it, it always seemed a little bit too ironic for me. I mean... We remember, like, going ahead a few years, we remember Ashes to Ashes as a big smash record mm -hmm. and fashion and so on, but it bombed in the States. So yeah. what's he do afterwards? He does a duet with Queen. I can't believe he liked Queen, you know, schlock <laughs> merchants, but he does that. And then then, and then he, gets in, he gets in Nile Rodgers. That was one of his best tunes. It's rubbish. He gets in Nile Rodgers and he just says to Nile Rodgers, I want hits. That's much later, though. That is much No, it's later. straight afterwards. Well, it's, it, that's 78. 70 yeah, no, we go, we go into right. Ashes to Ashes is like 80. Right, okay, okay. So, so yeah, yeah, so it would have been about 80, 80 81? 81 is Queen, 81. and then 82, he gets oh, in sorry. with Nile Rodgers. I'm sorry, and, sorry, yeah. And then he decides, I'm going to be a big pop star. Uh, and it, 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 it I think all seems... he decided that before, you know. I think he decided that before, but like with all so what's artists... what's it all about, Alfie? What's it about? Yeah, that's a good question. Like with all artists, uh, your 
And again, this reflects on football. You know, we started off talking about was this game against Germany, was it a failure of England players or was it a failure of the tactics? Well, in pop music, you are torn between two really important influences. One is the muse and clearly the muse for David Bowie. He was searching for many years for the muse. You know, is this yeah. the right way to go? Is that the right way to go? Otherwise, he wouldn't have done some of the howlers uh, that he did at that time. And They're we, interesting, though, aren't they? And it is yeah. interesting here, yeah. even in this one, that he but, still sounds like Anthony Newley. Yeah, well, I was going to say, they are in interesting from literally... Um, uh, interesting from an anthropological perspective of pop music. They're interesting in that respect. And you're right, Anthony Newley was one of uh, the great influences on him, but he hadn't found his way. And I don't necessarily think he found his way with Starman either, but that was still searching along. So when Which he- Which is breakthrough to... record, isn't it? Yeah, it's the one yeah. that, that makes him a star. Yeah, yeah. And, and th 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 these are the two aspects. It's on the one side, it's where the muse is taking you. And on the other side, it's where the public is. Remember, you can't lose sight of that. The reason why yeah. Marvin Gaye's What's Going On worked, he would have fallen flat on his face with what's going on if the public weren't already there. Yeah. If it didn't Barry Gordy didn't want, to, didn't want to release it. Exactly. And if it wasn't, if it wasn't already part of the, uh, the public's narrative and, and zeitgeist, as it were, in America, certainly, when you're having um, headlines like, like you had here, jail carnage, like my lay, uh, me lie, um, I, I think mm -hmm. is the right uh, pronunciation of the, um, of the, uh, the Vietnamese village. village that was um, basically laid to waste by Americans who did horrific things there. At the same time, though, you are getting, this is a headline, yeah, from The Guardian, April 29th, uh, 1972. Swedish women's lib want six hour day. <laughs> this is how it starts. Women's libbers, yeah, who 10 years ago succeeded in blocking the Swedish army's attempt to develop a nuclear weapon system are now demanding a six hour working day for parents with young children. This is just one of several radical proposals now being presented by the powerful Federation of Democratic Women. Their new program is designed to give parents and children more time together in a country where both parents usually have jobs. Now, the reason why I put on the voice <laughs> or the reason why I want to talk about the article is, again, this is part of the changing world. You know, you, you mm. are in the midst of not just war in Vietnam, but a, a revolution. of. See, this for me is a fascinating thing about the 70s. It's often thought of as the hangover after, the, you know, the 60s was a party and the 70s is the hangover. But a lot of the changes that started in the 60s are becoming much more general in the 70s. And You're one right. of those is, is, is gender roles. Yep, it's becoming much more academic because here now you're getting um, books like The Female Eunuch by Jermaine Greer, whereas in the 60s, it was just like, let's all get stoned and drop out and tune in or whatever it was. Now it's coming quite philosophical. All these points are uh, battles to be won for the sake of mankind, as it were. And uh, mm. a, a lot of men and women are sort of tuning in and thinking the world's got to change. Meanwhile, How did the 12 year old you cope with the androgyny of, 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 of glam rock? Of, I didn't of see any of that. You know, the funny thing is, it came almost as a surprise to me that um, even the androgyny of Boy George, who was much later, I didn't because we weren't brought up like that. I, I, my best friend came out, or one of my best friends, one of my two best friends at school came out to me at the age of 17. I remember it very well, very, very well. Uh, and it wasn't, we weren't, I think the prejudice that we had, the, um, um, the prejudice that we had was prejudice that was induced in us. It didn't really, in fact, most of us wanted to look like that because it was it was kind of the, the style of the day. You know, girls look like David Bowie um, and boys try to look like David Bowie and uh, everybody, it, it didn't, I don't think we thought of it in a sexual way at the age of 12. I, I certainly didn't, you know, uh, I, I knew no more about men loving men than I knew about men loving women. Although, you know, men loving women or women loving men was more the sort of norm, if that makes sense, of the time. But I knew no more about that, you know, if 
you heard one of these songs saying, come on, baby, light my fire. Who knew what that was about? I thought it was about lighting a fire, <laughs> a coal fire. Like I went and got the paraffin, and <laughs> pour a little bit of the paraffin on top of the coal. Don't whoosh, try this at home. Fire. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Don't try it at home anymore, kids. Listen, it's been a fascinating conversation. And we could go on about this great match for a long, long time and talk about the charts. And this great chart for a long, long time. Yeah, it's because, old, you know. maybe we'll do a special in 1972 at some point. But for now, mate, thank you very much.